this webinar is about corn rootworm. Uh, and we're looking to cover understanding corn rootworm, alternative forage options, and management options for livestock producers. I'm Marlene Pibamase, Dairy Specialist with OMAFRA, and I'm going to be moderating tonight's session. Our first presenters are Tracy Bauke from uh, OMAFRA, our feed, a field crop entomologist, and Christina Riley, our forage and grazing specialist with OMAFRA. Hopefully, the reason why you uh, have all come to attend is that um, you feel that this could be an important issue, and it really is. Um, we can't stress how concerned we are in this development and um, knowing that there's very few, if any, uh, tools that are going to be coming down the pipeline anytime soon. So we need to manage the situation now to at least help um, restore the durability of our BT rootworm hybrids, um, but also just to ensure that widespread resistance doesn't take place and then we start to experience significant yield losses and um, feed shortages going forward and, and management costs just skyrocket once we're having to um, deal with more widespread issues. So um, first, uh, many of you may have already seen rootworm as the adults. They're, they're much more obvious uh, than the other stages of the, the pest. We have western corn rootworm, um, predominant across Ontario, and northern corn rootworm, which is green on the right, um, that used to only be more predominant in eastern Ontario, but now these two populations seem to be spread, or two species of bees seem to be spreading across uh, the province. Um, they do feeding on silks and leaves, um, but it's really their larvae that are our main issue. You can't really tell the difference between their larvae, though. Um, it, it, they pretty much do the same thing, and regardless of the species. In terms of the life cycle, you're looking at um, it's one year, one generation um, per year. And we'll start with the adults. So we tend to see adults start to emerge around late July um, and, and live until about um, hard frost in, in the fall. Uh, they are very active. They move across um, many fields, but predominantly first start in the native field that they've emerged in and then move off to um, later planted fields if their native field is no longer ideal. They lay eggs in soil, in the, so the eggs over winter um, until about uh, early spring. The larvae come out in June and that's the stage that does most of the, the feeding damage. So you'll see them clipping roots and usually around um, early July is when you can start to um, do root damage ratings and determine what their impact is. Um, what we'll see though is the adults emerge not all at once. So and there's actually a fitness cost to resistance. So those individuals that are developing a tolerance to BT tend to take longer to emerge, which leaves only those survivors typically to mate with each other. So it actually increases the risk of resistance if there's no longer any susceptible individuals in the area to mate with. Also in August, that's the best time to actually determine if corn's going in that field the next year if it's going to need um, any protection. So one beetle per plant in August indicates that you need some mechanism, some tool uh, to manage your rootworm. So really this is what we're um, most concerned about. So rootworm tends to lay eggs only in corn, though there's some, some, some alternatives, but much not as, uh, not as common. Um, so continuous corn fields are really what's at high risk. And the ones that have used repeated corn rootworm hybrids um, year after year. The larva clip the roots and of course it, it impacts the nutrients and water intake into the plant, but also causes instability. So in a windstorm, uh, especially just before harvest, you will see um, these plants knocked down and then harvest is impacted. And, and um, often you'll see not only yield loss, but also uh, due to the um, poor nutrients in the plant, but also because the plants have been flattened on the ground. So you can um, see fields that experience 10 to 50% yield loss. Um, and we're starting, we see that now in, in US, but we're starting to see that here in Ontario. This is an example of what we saw this year. So um, last year we had one field uh, across from this one that had an issue. And this grower here in 2020 had a, a pyramid rootworm hybrid second year corn planted, and he experienced over 50% yield loss, mainly because of the unharvest, um, unharvested plants 
uh, that couldn't go to silage. Both of these neighboring fields had two different hybrids in them, and they only shared one of the Bt rootworm proteins uh, in common. So that tells us that in these th two fields, three of the Bt um, rootworm products were compromised. This is only one field. But there were several fields reported, you know, especially in Perth and um, Huron, but also in Durham region. And, and those are the only ones that we were aware of or that were obvious enough to um, be noted. So everyone shouldn't assume that as long as it wasn't their neighbor, they're not at risk. This is the kind of injury that you'll see. For each node clipped on the roots, you can experience 15 to 18% yield loss. And we tend to start to suspect that we have resistance if we see about a 0.5, so even just half of a node of a root being injured. And, and you're experiencing um, economic loss by then too. The image to the right is that same um, silage field that we were in. And you can see the significant um, number of plants that were left lying on the ground because of the lodging. And a lot of these roots would be about a two, um, some even a three on the uh, root injury scale. So it, it can be a, a big concern. And he took a significant loss. So the current status in the US um, is not good. <laughs> um, the first BT proteins that were registered was Cry3DB1 in uh, 2003 and slowly two other trait two proteins had come onto the market and within eight years of commercialization we had cross resistance to those um, and by 2013 in the u.s they experienced widespread resistance so they're seeing once they were are resistant to cry 3d1 they have cross resistance to the other two very similar um, um, hybrids or proteins, sorry, because they're closely related. They share, these three um, share the same modes of action. They're also starting to see issues uh, with Herculex. And, and so we're in Ontario probably seeing just before what they saw in 2013. So hoping, hoping that that kind of rings bell with people realizing we've got to um, do something. Oh, there has been up to now about a handful of um, cases over the last decade, but 2019 and now 2020 have really seen an increase. And we have experienced um, all but one uh, protein uh, that was compromised this, this year. Now, before I get into um, what stack or the different um, hybrids that are available, I wanted to explain the difference between stacked versus pyramid hybrids. Stacked hybrids just mean that there are two BT proteins in the plant, but they're not targeting the same pest. So there'll be one protein for corn borer, for example, and one protein that works against rootworm. So it's, it's quite easy for the um, pest to overcome a stacked hybrid because they're only having to uh, be challenged by the one protein that targets them. Really a better um, management strategy is to always go to a pyramid hybrid. The pyramid hybrid has at least two BT proteins that target the same pest. So in this case, two for rootworm, but it's not a pyramid hybrid for corn borer. So, but the importance is that you still have two functioning proteins in that plant that work against that target pest. Currently, as I mentioned, with um, three of the four being closely related, um, as soon as one overcomes one of the proteins, uh, rootworm, Come, overcomes one of the proteins, uh, they can tolerate the other two closely related ones without even having been exposed to them before. So in these problem areas, we no longer have functional pyramid hybrids working. The all, additional problem is that when single traits are also still in the landscape too. So there are still three uh, single trait hybrids out there for rootworm. So if these are also in the landscape along with the pyramid hybrid, then these rootworm can hop from a single trait over to a pyramid hybrid and, and overcome the other um, protein that's in that hybrid pretty quickly. So in essence, we end up um, compromising the pyramid hybrids. And so these are the um, pyramid hybrids that are available and you can see how there is a, similar combination. It's very hard to pick out a hybrid that doesn't have a shared um, 
proteins with another one that's commonly used. So that's really the, the issue that we're dealing with is that at best, we have one protein that's still working, if not both um, are compromised. And so um, these have ultimately become single trait hybrids if, um, if they're at all working, um, which increases resistance to that single useful protein still. So how do we solve this situation? Well, first we need to remove rootworm as best we can. The last two or three, I would even say four years have been really ideal for rootworm. So they've been building up in their population. And that resistance is not gonna go away now. It's, it's present in the population, it's not going to change. At best, we can knock back the rootworm population so that there's a lower level of them and they're not challenging these rootworm hybrids as much. As well, there's fewer individuals in the population that, that, that carry that resistant gene. So we really recommend to rotate out of corn for at least one, if not two years. Uh, we prefer two because we suspect that not everyone's going to be able to rotate um, out and out of corn in 2021. And if the crop landscape still has a lot of corn, that's still going to enable rootworm to build up. And even if there's an odd soybean or wheat field in the area, there's a chance that if populations are high enough, beetles may lay eggs in those fields just to get away from uh, the heavy density within the cornfields nearby. So, and we've strongly discouraged just moving to switching to a different pyramid hybrid that you haven't used before in hopes that that's gonna solve the problem because um, now those pyramid hybrids uh, in these problem areas are likely single trait hybrids at best. So here's just a visual of that. So um, again, corn rootworm really relies heavily on corn um, to, to lay its eggs in. So if you've had corn in 2020 and there are some resistant individuals nearby that flew into this field, they will have laid eggs and you will have had larva. If you rotate out of corn in 2021, that at least knocks back all of the larva that are in that field because they really strongly um, rely on corn as their host, the larva, um, to survive. But if there's enough individuals in the area, they could, or enough corn in the area, still there'll be enough of a population that could potentially lay eggs in your non-corn field in 2021. So really going for another year without corn really helps to knock back that population because there's going to be fewer that are finding corn to, to really successfully survive in. The other important matter when it comes to rotation is that we have to remove the volunteer corn plants too. Um, a study in Purdue tested volunteer corn plants following a, a, a BT rootworm field the previous year. And these plants had only 30% of the dose that um, they would have had if they were um, planted the year before uh, as a full, full dose that they would have gotten. So it increases the risk of resistance. For those growers who can't rotate, the next best option to mitigate the resistant issue is to consider planting a non-rootworm BT hybrid. So we're saying you can still plant a BT hybrid, but make sure it doesn't contain the BT rootworm proteins. So anything that's just exclusively for corn borer or for Western bean cutworm would work, except you need other root protection tools with that. So um, granular and liquid insecticides applied in furrow, um, they work really well. They work equivalent to a BT rootworm hybrid. But if you don't have the insecticide boxes, then that's an investment that you may still want to consider um, to help add another management tool to your toolbox um, going forward. But we, are, we do know that inventory is going to be low um, for these products in 2021. So the companies are aiming to meet demand for 2022. Another option is high rate neonic speed treatment. They work better on moderate to low populations, but they'll at least provide some root protection. So if you have had a pest assessment report done previously, you can gain access. Um, and another, a third option is biocontrol nematodes, which I'm really excited about because these first two options, the granular insecticides and the seed treatment really only protect the roots from rootworm feeding. They don't really kill off the population. But there's um, biocontrol nematodes that have been worked on in New York um, that are native here in North America and um, can be put into a, a field. And two, the first year, they're not as um, um, active, 
but second year they will start to actually control the rootworm. And so it's a good tool to consider um, to help enable us to restore our BT hybrids because there's been successful um, fields where um, after failures, they've um, implemented the nematodes and then um, planted the BT rootworm hybrids and saw very little damage. So anybody who's considering that, Oh, I have a slide on that actually. Um, so here's just an example. So um, it's Elson Shield from uh, Cornell University. And in a field that was inoculated in 2014, one time with these nematodes, um, coming back seven years later, planting a um, BT event with a, a known rootworm resistant population, the um, untreated or non nematode uh, samples or plots had still significant damage where going in with the nematode ground and putting in the um, BT rootworm hybrid um, was still successful and, and um, sustained, uh, was sustainable um, for longer term. So these are persistent nematodes. Um, if you're interested, please contact me because we, we will be trying to do some research um, to prove its, its usefulness here in Ontario. As I mentioned, soil applied insecticides, um, there's, there's a number of them registered, um, but again, the supply is low. Um, however, you will need to get insecticide boxes on um, your planters. And so I wanted to point out that just starting today, um, there's a new cap intake um, happening that uh, producers and custom applicators can apply for and get cost sharing for any management or equipment uh, tools that they need to address this issue, um, and that would that would cover even the insecticide boxes on planters, or um, even the biocontrol nematode costs um, to to implement to help uh, reduce this um, the spread of this resistant uh, population. So, it, if you want more information, um, please go to the OSCIA website to um, get an, an understanding of what the application process is like. And the deadline uh, is January sixth. Finally, if you can't rotate, then the next option is to use a pyramid hybrid. Again, this is the least preferred option because um, it continues the, to introduce the rootworm population to these proteins and continue to develop resistance. But a key thing is not to use insecticides with these. So soil insecticides and um, seed treatments shouldn't be used with these pyramid hybrids. One, because they mask any resistant cases, so we may not notice that this is happening, uh, even though you are sustaining some yield uh, in issues. And two, the combination of soil insecticides and BT actually delay uh, their, the adult emergence even more, so that you, we really are leaving only BT survivors at the end of the season coming out and mating with each other. Um, so it's very important to, to not add that combination. So again, though, this, this option still continues to expose the rootworm to these traits and, and can continue the selection pressure towards um, resistance. And it won't knock back your rootworm population. You're still um, trying to manage the same population you're dealing with year after year. So I'm going to turn it over to Prissy now so she can talk about um, what options there are for rotating out of corn uh, to enable you to, to mitigate this issue. All right, so as Tracy mentioned, our best option to get on top of this issue is to rotate out of corn so that we can knock back the entire corn rootworm population, including those individuals that are resistant. So there we go. Um, so as Tracy mentioned, corn rootworm larvae need corn roots to feed on and corn rootworm adults prefer to lay their eggs in cornfields. So continuous corn is our highest risk scenario for increasing the population. If we have BT traits being used in those fields, that's what's really pushing this resistance where the BT trait will no longer be able to protect our corn crops properly. So crop rotation is our best option to knock back the population, um, but rotating to just anything is not necessarily going to fix this. Dicots are our best choice because they're not hosts. So things like legumes, your alfalfa, um, clovers, soybeans, those are great options. Brassicas like canola are not hosts. Beets are another dicot that corn rootworm larvae won't feed on their roots. So that will seriously wipe out the population in that field. There are some 
grass species that are not hosts. Uh, winter cereals are one example of this because in the field, they have young growing roots, which rootworms would like, but those roots are young and growing at a time of year when the larvae are not active. By the time the larvae are active, winter cereals have mature roots that are not very palatable. Sorghum species are another grass option that are not host, uh, but for a different reason. So even though their roots are young and growing at the same time that corn would have young growing roots, uh, sorghum species produce some toxins that work against the rootworm larva. So just like you're familiar with um, sorghum species have durin that breaks down into prussic acid and can cause prussic acid poisoning in livestock. A similar thing happens with the rootworms. The roots are exuding durin and that cyanide is helping kill off the corn rootworm larva. So those are all good options, but some grass species are alternate hosts, which means that while they don't provide that same quality of nutrition to the rootworm that corn would, larva can still survive by eating on those grass species roots and make it to adulthood and lay some eggs and continue a population, which is particularly problematic if that population has a large number of individuals that are resistant to the Bt traits. So we know that this is not just a grain issue, which is why we're talking to you about this today. Um, one thing that we can learn from the American experience, and Tracy pointed out that they've been dealing with Bt resistance with corn rootworm for about a decade. When this first showed up, they treated it as a crop issue because in one sense, it very much is a crop production issue. But in another sense, it is a feed supply issue, which is why we're having this conversation. Um, they did not bring their livestock sectors on board right at the beginning. And without that understanding of why livestock producers grow corn and how they use corn and rations, uh, they weren't able to make strong recommendations to help those livestock producers move out of continuous corn. And we know that that's going to be very important for us in Ontario if we're going to get ahead of this challenge. Um, the map on your screen is showing fields that have had continuous corn for at least three years in orange. And you'll notice that many of the pockets that have a large concentration of those orange fields are in areas that also have live, large concentrations of livestock production. So while we know that livestock producers are not the only producers that grow continuous corn, we do know that they have a stronger incentive to do so because they need a consistent quality and quantity of feed. And while those corn rootworm BT traits have worked, they've been able to, to do that with corn. Um, so these efforts we're taking are really trying to safeguard the durability of those BT traits so we can continue to grow corn profitably in the future. All right, grain and high moisture corn, you all know it's an energy source in the ration. This slide is really highlighting how um, cereals are probably our easiest substitution crop wise, although there are probably some byproducts out there that can work as well in rations. Um, but it's not a one to one swap. And I'm going to let my livestock colleagues go more into the nutrition bit of how um, we might have to think differently about using cereals rather than corn, but I would like you to focus on the last column on this slide, that average yield column. So from an agronomy perspective, when corn does not have injury from rootworm, nothing else touches that yield potential. And from an agronomy perspective, as we deal with this, we know that that means we're either going to need to find more acres to grow the feed we need, or we're going to need to buy in an energy source. And all of that takes planning and winter is a great time to get that planning done. Um, I would like to point out that the average yield for fall rye is probably much lower than it should be. Uh, this data is coming from Omafra field crop stats and uh, from discussions with Joanna Fallings, she suspects that the reason that is so low is that fall rye is not receiving the same level of management that winter wheat is because we know from plot trials in Ontario that rye can have a very similar yield potential to wheat. So this looks like it's a management issue. Um, in general, winter cereals have higher grain yield potential than spring cereals. The other option that I've put up on the screen is maybe not as easy to switch to in the short term, but fodder beets are known to be a high energy crop that we know will grow in Ontario because it's different varieties of sugar beet. It's the same species, it's just different varieties. Uh, very high yielding, very high energy. 
the equipment might be a challenge, so it's probably um, a better option for long term, but it is something that could provide energy in a ration for both monogastrics and for ruminants. When we talk about silage production, uh, we know that it's playing a slightly different role in the ration. It's both energy and fiber. So again, our best options are grassy species. Some of these I've already mentioned are not hosts. So our winter cereals and our sorghum species are not hosts for corn rootworm, which is awesome. Um, some other options are potential hosts. So the ryegrasses, and I'll talk a bit about them more, but you'll notice when you look at that far right hand column, that yield potential column, nothing comes close to corn if it doesn't have rootworm damage. So again, this is where the planning comes in. This is where we have to figure out in advance, how are we going to get the feed we need? And it's possible, and I've got some ideas for you, but it does take planning and it does take working with a nutritionist to make sure that not only can we get the yield, but also they can get the quality to, to really keep production and, and um, health high with those animals. Now I've got alfalfa listed along the bottom in blue because it's not typically used as an energy source. It's a fiber and protein source in a ration, as I'm sure you know. Uh, but from a crop rotation perspective, it would be an excellent choice because it's a dicot, it's not a host for rootworm. So there may be some um, creative ways to get around this continuous corn thing once we've got the amount of continuous corn in the landscape down and under control using um, using the legumes that we already grow, growing a straight stand, that kind of thing can help us get away from continuous corn and put some good crop rotations in place while still growing the feed that we need. So one of our options for a corn free year would be to double crop a winter cereal and a sorghum species. Um, the ideal situation would be when the forage harvester taken off the corn comes out of the field the manure spreader goes in and it's being chased by a grain drill, putting in a winter cereal, whether that's fall rye or winter triticale. Um, that crop should be ready to harvest mid to late May, depending on where you are and what species you use. And then after you've given a bit of time for that regrowth to come up and either burn it down or till it for, for termination, going in and seeding a sorghum species, whether that's sorghum stand grass, uh, forage sorghum or a sedan grass. The forage sorghum is only a single cut crop, but the other two are multiple cut crops. In most parts of southern and central Ontario, we should be able to get two cuts and then go back into a winter cereal for um, over the winter and, and for the next spring. Um, it's great because they're non-host grasses. Our yield potential is higher than corn alone because neither of these crops have that same starch content of a silage corn, there will need to be energy supplemented into that ration. Um, the other flag that some agronomists will probably raise with this option is the risk of allelopathy. So fall rye has been known to suppress weeds and some producers have had issues establishing corn after rye. Um, if allelopathy is a concern with rye, winter triticale is lower risk on that front. With the sorghums, uh, the issue tends to be a plant population thing. So please, please, please do not jack up your seeding rates. Um, recommendations from 10 years ago were like 20 to 25 pounds an acre. It's much more common anymore to see 30 to 40 pounds an acre. But I had a call this summer about a failed alfalfa stand following a sorghum stand grass field that was seeded at 60 pounds an acre and the allelopathy meant that the alfalfa didn't catch. So please don't jack up your seeding rates beyond that 30 or 40 pounds with your sorghums. Um, if you're really concerned about lignin content, there's BMR hybrids, BMR varieties of um, all of those sorghum species, and they don't seem to have the same yield drag that's associated with BMR traits in corn. Um, the other thing is sedan grass has smaller stems and and thinner leaves than the sorghums do. So that may be another option to help increase palatability without jacking up your seed rate. So this is a slide you may wish to screenshot. It's the agronomy 101 of uh, doing this double crop. It's not everything that you need to know to, to grow this really, really well, but it does give a, an overview of your options and, and kind of enough information to get started. So we've got 
a few different options for a winter cereal. Um, I've talked about fall rye. I've mentioned winter triticale. Hybrid rye is kind of new on the market. It's exciting because since the hybrid, instead of open pollinated, the yield potential is 20 to 40% greater than that open pollinated rye. So there's some options there to, um, to get your winter cereal in. And then, um, as I've said, with your sorghums, forage sorghum is a one cut. So quality can be a bigger issue with the forage sorghums, but sorghum sedan grass and sedan grass both have good regrowth potential and are suitable for a multi-cut system. So that's the Coles notes. We've got more information in publication 811, which is the agronomy guide or on field crop news if you want more details on how to grow these crops. Now I know some people really don't want to grow a sorghum species. So another potential option would be using an annual ryegrass, um, either Italian ryegrass or Westerwald. So the Italian in a sense is more similar to a winter cereal in that it needs fertilization before it starts to set seed. So it has to go through a cold spell before it, it tries to head out. Whereas the Westerwalds are more like a spring cereal, they don't need that cold spell. So if you plant them in the spring, they're gonna try to set seed throughout the growing season. Um, these are both potential hosts. Uh, there, there's been pot trials assessing them in, in laboratory settings that suggest they are uh, very capable of bringing rootworms to maturity. Um, however, field experience in Europe suggests that coming out of four or five years of ryegrass has not had a problem for first year corn. So rootworms are not surviving four or five years in a ryegrass field. So I think for Ontario's situation, um, you'd wanna go to ryegrass for at least three years just to make sure that individuals are not bridging between your corn through your ryegrass to your next corn crop. Um, ryegrasses are extremely hungry. They take a lot of fertility. Um, you're looking at about 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre per cut. So 50 up front and then 50 after every cut except the last one of the year just to keep feeding that growth. The stuff is rocket fuel for ruminants. It is highly digestible, um, very digestible fiber, lots of water soluble sugars. So because of that digestibility, you're also going to see higher dry matter intake with feeding ryegrass in a ration because the intake is up, you're gonna need more acres because the yield potential is less than corn, you're gonna need more acres again. Um, one unique thing about ryegrass though, is that if you give it enough nitrogen, it packs on the crude protein. Uh, most other grass species top out at 16 or 18%. I've seen ryegrass analysis come in at 21 to 23. So with this grass option, potentially you could steal some alfalfa acres to make up the yield if you needed to, if you were using ryegrass to replace corn. Um, one of the big things about ryegrass though is it is difficult to terminate and I'll talk about that more in a moment but I wanted to highlight one other note that I made on this slide so you'll notice at planting I said tetraploid if you're planting in the spring um, probably for spring planting you're going to get the biggest yield if it's a westerwald variety and it's a tetraploid variety uh, ryegrasses have very flexible genomes so there can be a lot of difference between different varieties so a tetraploid is probably going to give you the best yield potential um, if you decided to swap out the winter cereal in the double crop option and use ryegrass instead go with a diploid go with an italian because the diploids are much more winter hardy and uh, your italian ryegrass tends to be a little bit more winter hardy than the westerwolds as well so that'll give it a better chance of overwintering if you wanted to swap it out there so I mentioned ryegrasses are tough to terminate and this is this is the main thing that we need to consider when we're using ryegrasses in a crop rotation is that because of their metabolism because of their really flexible genetics um, I mean this is a species that developed very very early herbicide resistance to group two so um, roundup on its own glyphosate on its own is not going to take out ryegrass if you try it you're probably going to be disappointed and then you'll have missed the optimum window to kill this crop and it gets harder when the plant gets bigger. So if you're terminating ryegrass before corn using a herbicide burn down, um, you're looking at a high rate of glyphosate tank mixed with Altum to make sure that you get that crop under control. Um, 
you've got to be very aware of the temperatures when you do that application. So it's got to be at least 10 degrees and getting warmer. And that grass has to be less than a foot tall because it's already putting up a fight just based on the biology of the plant. Um, also sprayers101.com is a great resource to make sure that you set up the equipment to really maximize herbicide coverage of the ryegrass to make sure that it's going to die when you kill it. All right, again, this is a slide mostly uh, for your screenshot purposes because it's the Agronomy 101 for ryegrasses. More information at fieldcropnews.com and in the Agronomy Guide for Field Crops. Um, but yeah, ryegrasses could be seeded either in the spring or in the late summer, depending on how you want to use them. So last but not least, we've talked about um, breaking up that continuous corn. Once we get through the next couple of years and we've reduced that population, the Canadian Corn Pest Coalition has come up with a recommendation for how we can use our BT traits sustainably going forward to protect their durability. So first year corn has low risk. Don't use a BT rootworm hybrid. You can still use BT against uh, European corn borer and Western bean cutworm, but no rootworm and no insecticides or seed treatments against rootworm either. Make sure that you scout that first year field because the second year, if the thresholds were met for the first year corn, that's where those treatments Tracy talked about are gonna come into play. Um, but you're still not using a rootworm BT hybrid in year two. Year three is where we bring in the corn rootworm BT traits, but we don't use the insecticides or the seed treatments. And then year four, we go into a non-corn crop. So we rotate it out of corn to knock back the population and start fresh again. So this is after we've gotten things under control in a couple of years. This is the kind of, of silage corn or um, grain or high moisture corn for feed. This is the kind of rotation we would want to encourage producers to adopt. So we're gonna talk more of the agronomy of rootworm in the Ontario Agricultural Conference coming up in January. So if you wanna know more of the crop side, please sign up for that. Um, we've got some more resources up on the screen. And also if you've got any suggestions of other crop rotations, we're all learning a bit as well as we start to deal with this issue. So if you've got suggestions for other silage options, um, please reach out to me, we'll have a conversation and I'll see if it's something that could be viable based on host potential and um, we'll go from there. Great, thank you, Christine and Tracy for that presentation. So we'll be taking questions after our next presentation, which is the livestock presentation. And this is prepared by our livestock specialists, Mario Mongeau, Tom Wright, James Byrne, and Megan Van Shake. Um, so I would like to invite uh, James to share that presentation. In this short presentation, I wanna bring forward a couple of thoughts related to the feeding of cattle that you might want to consider if you're planning to rotate out of corn. Whenever change lurks around the corner, it is always nice to know you have a plan on hand ready to deploy. To build that plan, you'll need to get information, explore options, and finally implement that action plan. Options for uh, substituting corn and rations can depend on the type of animal you're planning to feed, the age and the production level of those animals. There could be more than one option within the herd. Determine what your animal feed requirements are. How much livestock do you plan to feed? Uh, do an inventory of livestock by class and estimate forage dry matter requirements for each of these groups. Estimate the concentrate needs as well. Have a feed inventory on hand and take into consideration wastage and shrink in that calculation. It will be important to have a complete lab analysis report on hand for each feed you're planning to use. Some of the alternatives to corn or corn silage, such as small grain silage or sorghum silage and various commodities can uh, exhibit more nutrient variability. Be aware uh, of specific issues such as the potential inclusion limits or the toxicity that may occur with certain feeds. For example, when feeding sorghum, 
Uh, prussic acid poisoning can be a concern. And just like with uh, corn silage, nitrate poisoning uh, can also occur. Another possibility you want to explore is the option of land swaps to have access to corn. Obviously, that needs to be part of a crop rotation strategy. If you plan to swap or rent land, make sure uh, to put your agreement in writing. A verbal agreement is a binding contract, but a written one will minimize potential disagreement. Finally, make sure you keep your nutritionist or feed rep in the loop. Asking for advice early will help you build a solid action plan and the implementation will be much more effective. It is important that you choose a strategy that is best adapted to you and your farm. As I mentioned earlier, determine dry matter needs and solutions to fulfill them. If the plan includes a new crop, then make sure to, lo to locate and secure a, uh, a seed supply. When planning, hoping for the best is good, but planning for the worst is even better. So it is a good idea to identify pitfalls and potential challenges that may arise along the way and have a solution at the ready. Hi, this is James Byrne, a Mafra beef cattle specialist, and this short presentation will focus on root rootworm management, tips for cow, calf, and backgrounder producers. The following are some tips on minimizing the requirement for corn and making the most of your other stored forages. Body condition score your cows before the start of winter. Beef cows maintained in good body condition score over the winter feeding period usually require only good quality hay or haylage as a winter feed source. Where practical, divide cows into groups and target your best feed to those cows in less than ideal body condition score. Aim to feed your first calved heifers your best forage. Their feed requirement is high as they are still growing. Body condition score the herd again as the herd enters late pregnancy. It's important to feed test your forage prior to feeding to determine if additional supplementation is required. Minimize forage waste over the feeding period by ensuring that access to feed is controlled and feed is not wasted through trampling, etc. Note that TMRs will work well with other forages. Other considerations, implement a strong culling protocol. Target a culling rate of 10 to 20% to carry only those mature cows over the winter that you absolutely need. This will help reduce feed requirement and lower feed costs. A higher culling rate will help increase the number of replacement heifers in the herd. These lighter animals require less feed. Pregnancy check all cows after breeding. There is no benefit to retaining and feeding unproductive animals in the herd. Develop a compact breeding and calving pattern for your herd. Target a 70-20-10 breeding and calving pattern. This will simplify your feed requirements and boost herd productivity. Calves from compact calving herds are usually uniform and therefore can be weaned and sold together. Being able to sell a large number of calves at the same time reduces feed requirement and larger groups of uniform calves attract higher prices. Get the most out of your pasture. Plant annuals, cool or warm season, to provide grazing during the summer slump. Select pastures for pile grazing. Plant and graze cover crops over the fall and early winter to extend the grazing season. Improve the utilization of existing pasture by grazing at the correct stage and cover. High utilization of existing pasture allows for a smaller area for grazing and a larger area available to save extra forage. Plant an arable silage mix, such as wheat for wheatage, peas, oats, barley mix. Remember to harvest at the soft dough stage. More information on grazing pastures can be found at Omafra Forages and Pastures webpage. Backgrounder cattle. Young weaned cattle require diets higher in protein and less in energy compared to older cattle. Young cattle destined for summer grazing 
should be fed for medium gain rather than high gain. This results in a feed saving, which helps lower cost and gives higher performance at pasture over the summer period. Remember that corn and creep feed rations can be replaced with other small cereal grains. So some take home messages. Adopt simple livestock and pasture management practices to reduce the need for corn corn silage and make more efficient use of other stored forage options. Always maintain beef cows in good body condition. Only maintain those cows on the farm that are productive. Reduce feed waste at the feed bunk. Keep animals grazing as much as possible over the year. Small grain cereals, other than corn, can be successfully used in background diets. Feed test all forages. Work with your nutritionist to balance the ration to the results. Strive for production efficiency in all aspects of the production cycle. I'm Megan Vinchake, beef cattle specialist with OMAFRA, and on the cattle feeding side for feedlots, there are alternatives to grain corn as an energy source. Keep in mind that different grain sources have different nutritional attributes. The values presented here in this table are considered, are, they are book values for comparison purposes, but these values will vary depending on grain type, variety, growing conditions, etc. In terms of, of ranking for energy content, from highest to lowest, it is typically corn, then wheat, then barley, then oats. The outer hull accounts for the higher fiber levels and lower energy content of barley and oats. Keep in mind that energy content and rate of digestibility is influenced by rate of processing. So energy values are higher for processed grains. Protein levels tend to be highest in wheat, and this varies by class of wheat. Palatability is another important aspect to consider. Rye is reported to be less palatable than some of the other grain options presented here. The important messaging here is that it's important to work with your nutritionist to, to discuss grain alternatives that are a best fit for your feeding programs. A few notes on feed out here. Uh, it's really important to remember that wheat needs to be fed with caution. Compared to other grains, it degrades quickly in the rumen, putting cattle at greater risk of digestive upsets. Certainly, we can look to Western rations for corn alternatives. These rations are predominantly barley based, and, and there is some work done in the research community to suggest that similar results can be achieved. There's also research to suggest that feeding a combination of different grains or grains subjected to different processing methods can have positive benefits to performance and also decrease risk of acidosis, um, particularly when feeding out wheat or feeding grains with lower palatability such as rye. Field peas are another option for replacing energy in the ration. Hybrid rye is an opportunity to keep an, your eye on. Um, there's nothing really revolutionary about feeding it, but certainly some more, um, there are some agronomic benefits with respect to fitting it into a rotation, double cropping opportunities and increasing yields. With any ration changes, it's important to remember that slow transitions and step up approaches are, are keys to uh, successful ration changes. When making ration changes in terms of grain type and grain processing, it's important to consider the impact to ruminal pH and risk of acidosis. Grain type and degree of processing influences the rate of fermentation in the rumen, which can impact cattle health and performance. As a rule, wheat and then barley ferment the fastest, whereas corn ferments the slowest. However, this hierarchy is influenced by the type and extent of processing, and you can see that on the left-hand side there. So while reducing particle size can help improve starch digestibility, there is a bit of a balance here because it can also predispose cattle to digestive upsets. And that sweet spot for grind size is really dependent on a number of things, including grain type, type of processing, moisture levels, and, and roughage inclusion. There are a couple ways to check in on particle size. A practical one is by using a relative corn index. 
Um, this process involves a manual sieve stack to measure particle size distribution. And while the index is based on corn processing, this, the sieve stack itself can also be used to monitor changes in particle size distribution for other grains. Fecal starch is another good tool for uh, monitoring uh, changes to, uh, to the ration. So fecal starch uh, is a tool to assess undigestive starch. And yeah, again, it can be, it can be used uh, as a feedback mechanism for your feeding program. Um, it is a measure of feed ut utilization efficiency. And just a measure, uh, just a reminder to employ your best practices around bunk management. Sound bunk management is also very important to reduce incidence of digestive upsets. Don't forget to include sufficient effective fiber, especially if you're looking at replacing corn silage in the ration. And remember that bunk management tools such as a bunk scoring tool, as seen here, can help you monitor um, adaption of cattle to ration changes and step ups. Okay, we're gonna turn our attention to some nutritional considerations for dairy cattle. My name is Tom Wright, I'm a dairy specialist with Anafra. When you're changing a diet, uh, this can create both economic and animal health risks. I think the biggest risk is probably gonna to be to the milking cow program from both a money and a animal health perspective. I say this because it's the highest dry matter intake group compared to the others. Um, and this is a group that has a pre-existing risk factor to it. So transition cows are particularly at risk for metabolic and other secondary complications and affecting milk yield and components in transition cows can certainly impact uh, the whole lactation curve as well. I don't want to overlook the importance of heifer and dry cow programs, but I think we'll be able to manage the risk there um, easier compared to the milking cow program. So start with some good news first, I guess. Very different diets can support good health and production. I pulled this data from Lactinet uh, from Ontario and Saskatchewan. If we look at the two graphs, um, milk production and the black line at the top, Saskatchewan does very well. Their barley-based diets support milk com composition very similar to Ontario and Quebec. If we look at milk fat in blue and milk protein in red, those lines uh, have similar patterns of seasonality and similar patterns in terms of percent content in milk. So good management on different diets can certainly achieve good results. Looking at grain source on milk composition, this is some numbers from a 2008 study uh, published from the University of McGill. They looked at five years of tie stall, so only tie stall data uh, from Quebec. And from their data set, I only pulled out the second lactation cow data. So herds that were feeding uh, grain uh, source as either barley uh, corn grain or high moisture corn. Uh, barley, a little bit lower in terms of milk uh, kilogram yield per lactation than the, uh, the corn options, but very similar in terms of fat and protein per lactation. Slightly higher in terms of MUN, uh, and that was a st statistically significant difference over uh, both of the corn options, uh, but uh, not, uh, not uh, too much so. Managing with alternative grains. So as Megan mentioned in her presentation, starch degradability rate differences, uh, impacts of processing, certainly gonna be an impact uh, to the dairy sector as well. Uh, we're certainly concerned about matching up uh, efficiently energy and nitrogen synchronization in the rumen, certainly for good microbial protein synthesis. And we wanna be avoiding situations of subacute ruminal acidosis. So on those farms where we're running fairly simple buffer packages, um, is there an opportunity there for us to maybe uh, in increase the buffering capacity in our diets as well? I think there probably is opportunity there. Uh, but don't overlook the importance of bunk space and feeding behavior on an individual farm. So how the animals are eating and their behaviors can impact um, some of the rations that we might see as being good on paper, but not necessarily performing. And some of those can relate to uh, social characteristics and environmental setup uh, on a farm. Some situational considerations and monitoring opportunities. So places with computer feeders, for example. So what are those allocations gonna look like? Um, what's the nutrient composition of that product gonna be? Uh, and very similar to robot herds, what's the 
you know, what's that complementary robot pellet going to look like if we've changed the PMR um, radically uh, away from corn? And how do we make sure we're maintaining robot visits, um, good motivation to attend the robot, and make sure we're uh, getting good room and health with those diets as well? So monitoring options for any farm uh, starts with observing the animals. Uh, we can do ration particle size evaluation, monitor feed refusals to check for sorting, know the signs and symptoms of Sarah, uh, manure appearance monitoring, maybe using some precision technologies if those are available in terms of like rumination time, MUN data, milk composition data, milk yield data from DFO, for example, very good ways of staying ahead of the curve when making changes. So some take home messages, it's very possible to achieve good results when you're changing to very different feeding programs, have really good communication with your advisory team, don't overlook the environmental and behavioral factors that could be affecting how those new rations perform. Um, monitor new feeding programs carefully. Use some of the tools that are available to you. Um, that's my contact info. I'm looking forward to any good questions and answer uh, session with, uh, with anyone online. And we'll turn it back over to the moderator. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, James, for, for sharing that presentation. So we're going to move very quickly into the question and answer period uh, with Tracy and Christine in particular. So we do have one uh, question that came through the chat from Jerry. Thoughts on control in wireworm uh, WCR fields? So I think what Jerry's asking is, um, well, there's two potential. Is is the rotation that we're suggesting the three year corn and and one year off still prone to wireworm? It is. Well, really, it's not the rotation as much as your soil type. Wireworm is a larva that can stay in the soil up to seven years. Um, they really like sandier soil um, and hilly fields. Um, the important thing they they tend to like cereals and and um, corn and grasses as well. So any new crop that you're putting into these wireworm prone soils for rootworm uh, mitigation, just ensure that if it is a host crop like a, a bean or um, cereals, then you also use a soil insecticide or a seed treatment uh, to protect for wireworm as well. Though check the label because not all products that um, control wireworm have, have rootworm on the label and vice versa. I think if I understood that question correctly. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, thank you for, for answering that. Um, another question that came in um, was, uh, what about refuge corn areas? Is, would that be a way to manage the problem of corn rootworm resistance? Not really, and this has been always the problem. Um, we are now really going into, we have mixed seed, right? Mix, refuge in a bag. So about 5% of any plant in your BT field is a non-BT hybrid or plant. Um, the issue with rootworm is that when they emerge from their soil, they mate very close to, uh, they find a rootworm nearby to mate with, uh, more so than like corn borer that flies out of the field and looks for mate. So we really do need, uh, if we were going to go down the refuge route, we would have to have strips again because we've, we've, as the researchers have always been against going with the um, refuge in a bag because of the higher risk it's posing. Um, it, the ideal refuge for um, rootworm is that we put, you know, four to eight strips of non-BT throughout the field so that you're trying to get them to mingle a bit more. Um, but I think we are somewhat past that. Um, in terms of uh, reducing the risk right now, what we really need to do is knock back the entire rootworm population um, so that we are, are, again, starting kind of from scratch uh, when populations start up and build um, what they've been exposed to. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, one more question here, probably before uh, you need to leave in a little bit here, but uh, can you explain again the ideal management for rootworm when rotation is not an option? Absolutely. So the next option is you're going to be planting corn. Ideally, to reduce the risk of resistance continuing, we don't expose them to BT rootworm proteins. So that means you're using either a non-BT hybrid entirely or a BT hybrid that only contains proteins for above-ground pests, the so left. 
um, like corn borer and western bean cutworm. As long as those, those are the only Bt proteins in the plant, the rootworm's not being exposed to a protein that could develop resistance to. It's not even going to target them. So that's our next best option, non-BT rootworm hybrid or a non-rootworm, sorry, non-BT hybrid completely. If you have to plant a non-BT rootworm hybrid, you need root protection though. And that's where we say use a, a soil applied product or seed treatment, or if you're really keen on trying the bio control nematodes, um, contact me because we're, we're hoping to de um, develop some research sites and, and demonstrate their applicability here. Okay, um, so another question that came in here is what about using grasses like orchard grass or tall fescue, um, are they host grasses? Yeah, so there's been some research done on the host potential of a variety of different species. When it comes to those perennial grasses, uh, some of them have more host potential than others. So I think the safest route is to kind of treat them a lot the same way that I suggested with perennial ryegrass. Please don't stick them in for just one year and then go back to corn. Because they're perennials, in most situations, it's probably less likely anyway. They're probably going in for at least a couple of years. Um, but yeah, with any grasses or an alfalfa grass mix, ideally that should be in for at least three years just to really prevent a uh, rootworm population from hanging on between one corn crop and the next. But for one year, yeah, the risk would vary depending on the grass species, but it's still a risk and it's not one that I would suggest somebody take. It's, it's safer to leave those in for um, a couple of years or use a straight alfalfa stand, some sort of dicot as a one year. So if you have one takeaway that people should take away from tonight's webinar, uh, we'll start with you, Tracy. What would that be? Don't assume you're not at risk because reports only come in, um, uh, not all of them come in to me, and uh, industry is not necessarily able to share uh, these uh, potential reports as well. It just means that injury wasn't necessarily bad enough yet, but it will be. So we really do need to take these measures seriously and uh, reduce the risk of widespread um, resistance across the province. Yep. And what about you, Christine? One takeaway from your part of today's webinar. I think the biggest thing people can do to be proactive is get all the experts involved in the same planning conversation. So most farms, you've got three experts around. You've got the producer who knows their equipment, their labor, um, any production problems and, and how their system works that's unique to their farm. They're one of the experts. You've got an agronomist. Now they may be a, a qualified CCA or they may be you know, a crop input supplier. I'm using agronomist loosely. It's whoever helps you with your crop plan. They're the second expert that should be at the table. The third one is your nutritionist. And again, I'm using that in the broadest possible sense. Could be a feed rep, could be who, whoever it is that helps you with your feed plan get those three individuals on the same phone call. Most smartphones have an option to have a three-way call. So it'll be a button that after you call one person, will say like add call or merge call. And you can, you can get everybody on the same conversation and talk it through because it really minimizes the opportunity for miscommunication. It prevents that horrible game of broken telephone where the producer is going between advisors trying to take in everything that they're saying and then remember it and, and interpret it for the other advisor when those two maybe don't understand why the other person is giving the advice they're giving. So by having everybody on the same phone call, you can all be on the same page. You can come up with a plan that makes good agronomic sense to manage rootworm, to provide good manure application options, but that also meets the feed and forage requirements of the farm. So nutritionally, it also has to make sense. And by getting everybody on that same phone call, it really opens up those communication channels and puts a farm in a good position to have a successful year in 2021 and 2022 and into the future as we try to keep corn rootworm from becoming a really, really devastating pest. And I'll ask if one of the livestock specialists would provide us with a key takeaway message. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Here I am. Yeah, I guess I would just echo what uh, what Tracy said there. It, like, don't assume you're not at risk. And the, the easiest thing to do is steal from what Christine said as well. 
um, definitely have a plan in place. So you don't want to be in a situation like from those pictures that um, Tracy showed where you've got uh, serious problems, whether it's 2021 or 2022, and you might have been able to avoid those with some planning. Um, we don't want to get into a situation of rescue crops and things like that. If you can proactively put something together, ruminants are tremendous, uh, have tremendous capacity to eat a variety of ingredients and we can build rations for a lot of different ingredients, um, balance them for high production um, or for growth. Uh, we just need to have a little bit of lead time to make those plans work best. So that's my, that's my echoing of those two. Uh, don't assume it's not something that wouldn't happen in your area. And yeah, start making those phone calls right away. Um, Cause the sooner you can plan, uh, the easier it is to, uh, to have something that uh, is gonna work for the herd, the, the economics of your operation, uh, life will just be a little bit easier. Yeah, thank you so much. The winter is a good time for planning. So um, I think we'll end the webinar there. Thank you so much to everybody present presenting today. Uh, and also to our participants that joined us tonight. Thank you and have a good evening.